Hi, Tim. We'd like to, uh, are you going to call it to order or am I? The, I think you're. I think you're the one though, really? Huh? I'm de is it, do I it's you, Mr. Mayor. It's Mr. Mayor. It's, oh, <laughs> well, welcome to the uh, <laughs> vision committee meeting this evening. And uh, Denise is on um, TV there. Would you call the roll, please? You're muted, Denise. We've been trying to do that for years, but we want to do that. Oh my gosh. It's true. No, it's not. No. You're still muted, I think. You're still, still Excuse you're still me, muted. you're still muted, ma'am. Uh, maybe Josh needs to. Nope. nope. Might not be you, though. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Council Member Denny. Here. Council Member Maloney. Here. Councilwoman Smisher. Thanks, Denise. I'm here. Um, as a point of order, I just wanted to flag for the city that their video does not appear to be on. Over. <laughs> Council Member Stein. Here. Council Member Tracy. Here. Council Member Worthington. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hamrick. Here. Mayor Troutman. Thank you, here. Okay, then, um, John, do you want to start out with it? Uh, well, Isn't it yours or is it mine? Uh, that, that, I gave that for <laughs> Oh, for, for mine. Benefit. Thank you so much. You get to keep it? Okay, so this evening we're going to have a discussion in the retail coach, and we would defer to Rick Herman, our economic development coordinator, and uh, go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, back in 2022, the city entered into an agreement with the retail coach. For uh, if you remember, prior to that, we had uh, we we had a contract with a company called Buxton, and that was a 50 grand a year contract that we had with them. Um, the services that they provided, the services they were going to provide, along with the data. Um, fell out of favor with them. They no longer provided those services. And I met Aaron at uh, an ICSC conference in 2021, I believe it was. And uh, we began conversations about how the retail coach works with communities to actually recruit uh, retailers and assist with that, plus also provide data that we can use as marketable data that was similar to the Buxton data. Uh, so 2022, we entered an agreement with um, the retail coach for a three-year annually renewed agreement. This is our second amendment. This would be our second amendment to the agreement. And um, I noticed on the agreement that you have in front of you for the next council meeting, it says second and first. So that'll be corrected for the council meeting <laughs> before we get there. But. Um, Aaron Farmer has come down, come up from Texas to have a conversation with us, share, us, share more about how we are working with them, what we are doing, what we're working on. Um, some information, of course, since it's um, real estate related is somewhat um, confidential, so we can't necessarily name all of the names of the companies that we're working with, but he'll give a pretty good snapshot of where we stand in the relationship. Uh, working into the next council meeting for uh, approval of the second amendment. So I'd like to introduce Aaron Farmer. Good. All right. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Mayor and Council, it's good to, good to see you all again. Good, good to be here. Uh, I, this is my third time to come to Canyon City, so I uh, have, have been here a couple of times. Enjoy spending time here. Uh, excited, to, excited to talk to you today. I, I put together a, a short presentation just to kind of talk about really where we where we started where we've been and where we're going from a from a retail recruitment standpoint um, so when that comes up i'll i'll, I'll start I'll, I'll share that with you but just a little bit um, of background on the the partnership and and really just kind of who we are just as kind of a refresher of what 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 this partnership looks like but um, it is a Retail recruitment uh, and development strategy is, is what we're looking at here. And, and basically what that means is we're out there under, helping, 
helping you, helping retailers, developers understand what is the opportunity here in Canyon City, and then connecting retailers, restaurants with property owners, with properties, and, and really just trying to recruit them to, to the market here. So um, I'll, I'll just kind of jump into this, but a, but a background, a little bit about what we do and what our partnership is with, with Canyon City. So at, at the end of the day, we help communities identify what, what are your retail opportunities, right? So how much opportunity exists here for, for new retail, whether that's national retail, whether that's regional retail, whether that's local retail. Um, and then we actively recruit or help those existing businesses to, to, to better their business, right? Can we bring somebody in that, that's maybe not being served by an existing business? Is there an existing business in town that we can help expand or help them understand who to market to? And then we co coach our communities on, on long-term success. So, uh, Colorado is not the only state we work in. We have a very good understanding of what's going on in Colorado from a retail restaurant development standpoint. A lot of times when there's new retailers moving into the market, we're the first call they make. Hey, we know you work with some of these communities. Where, where do we need to locate, right? So we try to have a very good pulse on what's happening on, on this market, um, but we also work across the U.S. So having an understanding, I'll tell you, there's, there's a few states that are, are still going strong from an economic development standpoint. Um, Colorado's in that, Texas is in that, North Carolina, Illinois is another one that we're seeing a lot of retail restaurant growth, a lot of interest um, from retailers and restaurants. So. Our process here, um, it's that retail 360 process. So just as a refresher, you know, we start at the beginning analyzing the market. You know, where are consumers coming from to shop and eat in Canyon City? We know you've got really two different customer bases. You've got your, your primary trade area, which are your local, you know, your your day-to-day -day consumers, like the, the, you know, the ricks of the world that live here, work here, right? You've got that primary consumer, but then you also have that tourist, right? The people that are coming here for the Royal Gorge and, and for other things um, and understanding those opportunities. So that's starting with that. We look at sites, what, are, what sites are available. Um, we identify retailers, restaurants, developers that should be here, that aren't here, and then we recruit them. So we represent um, Canyon City on a, on a daily basis to retailers, restaurants, developers. We attend these trade shows together um, at, at, throughout the country. Um, and then we're working and focusing on downtown as well. How can we help downtown? And, and we're gonna look at some of that data here. So that's a little bit about the partnership. Um, very, very important that we understand who that Canyon City consumer is, right? I mentioned you've almost got two different consumer bases. You've got that everyday consumer, and then you've got that, um, that, that, that tourist, somebody like me that's coming to town to visit the Royal Gorge or to, to, to do something like, to, to do other things like that. So we are still using a lot of cell phone data, but even in the last two years of working together, that cell phone data has, has evolved even more. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But again, just as a reminder, if you have a cell phone, which most of us do, right? Uh, or some of us have two cell phones, we're, we're being tracked in, sense, in a sense, right? Now we're not using that data. We're not selling that data, right? At the retail coach, we're not doing that, but we're using that data to help convince retailers, restaurants, developers, they need to invest in this community. We can look at any business in town and we can see how many people walked in that business last week. We can see how many people walked into that business last month. We can tell over a year. Our data goes back in Canyon City about four years um, is what that data looks like there. But I wanted to look at, at, at just the downtown historic district, right? So as I drove in today, um, it was busy downtown, right? There were, it was hard to find a parking spot in, in downtown. Um, you know, we, we look at, you know, what, is, what does this look like? One thing I noticed, and, and Rick and I noticed this a little bit as well, there's no real fluctuation here. It's pretty, it's pretty solid across the, um, you know, 15,000 15, visits uh, per, mo per month is about what we're looking at here. And um, it, it was noticeable that there's not a big spike in, in the summertime, which you would think with that influx of, cons uh, of visitors that you have, we should see a spike there. So trying to understand why there's not a spike is something we look at there, but we're using this data to, to just understand who is that consumer? Where are they coming from? So this heat map here shows us where they're coming from. We can, we can tell down to a zip plus four, zip code plus four level of where your consumers are coming from. Um, and, and we can, we can analyze and, and use that data, but we're using that to convince retailers and restaurants they need to open a store here. They need to open a location here. They can be successful. Um, so we can see, you know, hourly visits. Friday's the busiest day um, in downtown, followed by Saturday. And then there's a, s a steep drop off on Sunday. A lot of that has to do on Sunday is just 
a lot of the businesses aren't open on Sunday, right? Um, but then we're comparing that to and looking at national retailers as well. So Walmart, as an example, um, you can see, um, you know, you're, you're pulling people from, um, you know, all over. Uh, but really, we've got that primary trade area that we'll focus on here in a minute. Uh, but you have a large draw that is coming to shop and eat here. Uh, we were in uh, Buena Vista this last week uh, doing some, some whitewater rafting with my family. It was my four-year-old's birthday and that's one of the things we did um, and what was interesting is our guide that took us out she she lives there but she shops and she comes to Walmart in Canyon City at least once or twice a month right so you've got people that are coming from from throughout the region to shop and eat in Canyon City whether it's daily um, or you know so you, you have a large draw this was interesting to see but at your Walmart only 19.5 percent of your consumers came from the Canyon City zip code, right? So that means 80% of your consumers came from outside of Canyon City, right? So that was pretty interesting to see is you, you serve a diver, diverse um, customer base, right? That's coming from all of these different locations here. Uh, you know, Salida, uh, Florence, Penrose. And if you're familiar with the 81212 area, it's pretty big. It's a pretty big area. Yeah. So. We're, we're pulling people from a lot. So we're using this cell phone data on, on a regular basis, but this cell phone data has evolved um, to where we now have the ability to actually rank your locations, right? So your national retailer locations. You know, we've heard that Starbucks does well. We've heard that Chili's does well in their system. But now with this cell phone data, we can compare how well your Chili's does, how well your Starbucks does to others throughout the state, throughout the US. And now we're gonna start using that data um, as another just recruitment tool to where we can go to another casual sit down restaurant and we can say, Hey, look at, look at our, look at our chilies. They do this well in their system. If you were to locate here, you would, you, you know, you'd be able to do similar here. So the cell phone data is, is very interesting to look at, you know, Saturday, Friday, Saturday are, are about even for Walmart in terms of visits. And then followed by Sunday being their, bus their busiest days. Yes, ma'am. Is your cell phone data skewered at all by the fact that there's an awful lot of people that I know personally that moved from other places but kept their other area code? That's a great question. And this is where it gets really scary. So I'll say that. Um, so it's not based on your area code of your phone and it's not based on the zip code of your billing address or not, okay? It's based on where do you spend your evenings between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And that's what we're considering your home address. So if we go back and we look at this heat map here, where we see the red on the map, that's the highest concentration. It's, it's mapping to your, where you spend your evenings between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So that's how we know it's a, a pretty, accurate, um, pretty accurate science for determining where consumers come from. Before we had cell phone analysis like this, we used license plate surveys. And we used to have those, if you've ever seen the Google car, Google, or, or what do they call that? The Google, the Google car. The Google think, car yeah. driving around. We used to have uh, people at our office that would, would drive around with, with cameras mounted and we'd have to scan license plates. The problem with license plates were it would tie it back to wherever your vehicle was registered, right? So uh, it might have been a work vehicle, it might have been a gover government vehicle, or you might have moved and didn't change your registration. So that's why the cell phone analysis is so, so accurate. Um, but we can do a lot of new things. But what we can do now with the cell phone data is we can analyze the, the local traffic and, and, and basically draw a consumer profile of the lo local traffic. And then we can also draw a separate consumer profile of your visitor traffic as well. So we're using that to convince these retailers and restaurants that are maybe like on the edge, they're not sure Canaan City is the right place for them. We're using that data to help push them over, push them over the edge. And we're gonna be uh, one of the, um, it's gonna be a lunch and learn in August that Caroline Harrelson from the Retail Coach is gonna to come to, to present that. We can use that data, the profiles of the people coming to the community to help our local businesses identify how to, how to market to their customers. That's how we were gonna use the Buxton data and that's the service that Buxton was gonna provide that they terminated. Um, but we're gonna, that, that lunch and learn will be for businesses to come and understand how how can you find out who your customer is? How do they, how do they, how do they get their information? Um, the Buxton stuff used to break you down into a profile or where you know if you're reading newspapers and magazines and books or if you're getting all of your data online through social media, through 
um, those, those methods. Um, we're not, I'm not sure that the data they can provide can get that granular, but it was pretty telling, it pretty telling where I, where I fit into the, into the profile of these people. I looked at mine, it's like, mm, that's pretty accurate, you know, that's yeah. and, scary and, accurate, actually. And, and we, we can't get down to that level, so we can get down to that, to that level there. And that's what we want to talk about uh, in this Lunch and Learn with the local businesses. How can they better market their companies and, um, or businesses? Yes, ma'am. Your microphone. I'm confused about uh, sure. the Walmart piece of this puzzle. Uh, there's a huge Walmart in Salido. Why is our, our Walmart traffic coming from even from that area and farther west, like Buena Vista? Do we is our Walmart that much bigger? Is that what it is? You know, it's it, it's not, and that's that's a good that's that's a good. Um, I mean, it doesn't make sense it, that you drive that typically far. Typically, you don't pass another Walmart to get to, to, to go to another Walmart, right. right? We've heard a few, we've heard some things where that, that Walmart doesn't carry some of the items or some of the different mm -hmm. categories that some of these people like, so they're passing by. I haven't done a deep dive yet to figure out what are those categories and what that is, but that's what we've heard just anecdotally, is that's part of the reason there. Um, we've heard that, you know, some of them are, 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 going to the, are going to Colorado Springs, and then on the way back, they're hitting Canyon City Walmart, and some of those things on the way back, but we'll dive a little bit deeper and see if we can figure out more on, on why that's the case. Yeah. So just a real quick recap. Um, this is what we're out there pitching to retailers and restaurants on your behalf. Um, we know that you're pulling people from outside of uh, Canyon City to shop and eat here. So what we, what we do is we focus on retail trade areas. Um, so the retail trade area is what, how Rick and I have talked about. This is what we recommend to our clients. When you're talking to a retailer, forget about your city limits population. What they want to know is where is your consumer base coming from? How big is that trade area? And so based off of the cell phone data, this is your primary trade area. About 70% of your consumers that are shopping locally um, or shopping here in town come from within this retail trade area. We're going to need to make a change over the next couple of months. We're starting to see more people um, uh, to the east here towards Pueblo coming to Canyon City to shop and eat. So this trade area is going to extend this way. And then one of the things that we've talked about as well is looking at a secondary trade area with the information that we've got gotten from people from Salida and other places uh, coming this way. I don't think we want to do that yet, Josh. <laughs> Uh, we th coming this way, we think there's the need for a secondary trade area so that we can go to some of the larger, more national retailers and restaurants um, and, and, and be able to do that. So I wanted to point that out. Just a few other slides I wanted to point with you. Um, your retail trade area. So the population that Canyon City serves on a regular basis is now over 50,000 people. Um, from last year's numbers, we're up 1,500 people within that retail trade area. So growing population um, and then what really stood out to me was your average household incomes have increased in that trade area so they're up about seventy seven hundred uh, dollars so we're at over eighty thousand is the average household income within the trade area i think and rick and i talked about the, the this afternoon i think we're going to be at about a hundred thousand average household income within the next three years um, within that within that retail trade area um, so these are the numbers that we're out there pitching we also look at retail demand so this is a hard one to read, so, so you don't have to do that. But basically, we look at 75 different retail sectors. So everything you can think of from fast food restaurants to casual sit-down restaurants to furniture stores, there's a category that a retailer would fit into here. And what we've done is we've looked at what is that retail opportunity this year in, in 2024? And then what is that retail demand going to look like five years down the road? And what I just wanted to point out with this is that you have, uh, Canyon City has a compound annual growth rate of 2.74%. So that means over the next five years, we're projecting y'all to grow at 2.74%, uh, um, again, compounded annually. Um, I was telling Rick this, that's within the top five, um, that 2.74 that is within the top five of all of the communities that we're working in. So that, that shows us that there is a need for more retail. There is strong demand for retail. So you're growing in just about every category. So that, you, that is, excuse me, is, is that in retail spending, 2.7% in retail spending? Retail spending, correct. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. So call it retail spending, call it retail demand, call it retail potential. Kind of all three of those uh, things mean the, really probably mean the same thing. But even in a lot of other communities where we see a negative growth in clothing, 
because people are buying clothing online and those sort of things, you're still, even though the growth is not heavy there, uh, we're still showing positive growth here in the community. So that that's positive there. And then you've got certain categories like full service restaurants, 2.36%, limited service restaurants, 2.4%. Uh, a lot of the interest that we've had as of late, say the last six months or so has been from restaurants wanting to, to locate here in the community. Um, so I just wanted to point those things out to you. And then lastly, um, talk about site identification. One of the big things that um, we have to do um, as your, as your retail recruitment uh, partner is we have to have a good understanding of what sites are available at all times. So Rick is really helpful about this. If he talks to somebody local that's thinking about selling their property or, or leasing the property, he'll text us, he'll email us, he'll call us and let us know that. But we try to have a very good pulse on what properties are available. So it could be like the Office Depot space that's available right now. We've, we've heavily been working with uh, the owner there to market that property to potential prospects. Uh, there, there's other properties that can be, but we have to have a very good understanding. So what I wanted to talk about and what I really wanted to get into was recruitment, just to update you on what's happening from a recruitment standpoint. So just as a, a refresher, one of the things we do is we come in and we run a void analysis. And what a void analysis does, it'll tell us who's missing from this market, what retailers, what restaurants are missing from this market that should be in this market, right? You fit their customer profile. So you have their trade area population, their, the, you match their, their incomes they look for. So we do that and we've identified, we've gone after roughly 50 to 75 uh, retailers and restaurants over the last year. Um, when I say go after them, that means aggressive recruitment. So phone calls, emails, um, a lot of times it, all it takes is texting a retailer. Hey, can you site selector? Can you come look at this market? Can you give us your feedback on that? Uh, but we, you can kind of see what our process looks like there. We attend all of the major retail conferences. So um, we've, we've had a chance to go to, with, to a few of these with Rick and it's not just going out there to attend these conferences, but we set up meetings ahead of time. I think this was our best year yet from a, from a meeting setup standpoint um, where we're meeting with the site selectors, the decision makers. And then once those conferences, those events happen we have to continue to follow up hey here's a site that's available um, you know hey can we invite you to town just in the last two weeks we've had a sandwich shop in town and we've had um, we've had another restaurant in town touring the market looking at sites and that's the goal can we get them here right if we can get them to Canyon City um, a lot of times it sells itself I was telling Rick I, I was in town driving around uh, for a couple hours earlier today things were busy. I, I commented on like Big R and, and City Market and how busy that area was, right? And, and looking at Walmart too, and, and even downtown, I talked about that earlier. If we can get these site selectors to town where they can see what's happening here, it, it tells a better, it tells a really good story, even a better story than maybe what you see just from a, a Google Maps or aerial view. So that's what the recruitment process looks like. Um, some of the trade shows that we just recently attended, um, ICSE Red River, which is in Dallas, but covers um, Colorado as well. Uh, ICSE Vegas, we were there just this last May. And then these are some of the upcoming ones. So we've got one that's upcoming called Retail Live, which is in Austin. Um, you'll see a lot of the, the, the brokers, developers out of, out of the Denver area um, go to that Austin conference. There's a lot of, care, a lot of crossover uh, there. We're going to be attending and representing um, Canyon City at the ICSE Western Conference, which is in um, Los Angeles. So we'll be out there uh, doing that. You know, where you're located here, a lot of your site selectors are coming from the Dallas area, Phoenix, um, and then, and then California, right? So, um, we try to hit those three, kind of those three main areas there, because that's, again, that's where the site selectors are coming from, but you can see what some of those trade shows coming up look like. And then I don't know if y'all had a chance to see this, but we use a system called Airtable, um, uh, that Rick has access to, uh, 24 seven. Uh, but we keep track of every phone call, every email, every text with the retailers and restaurants that we talk to. So you can see some of the ones listed there. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll mention we've contacted them, what the status is, we're waiting on feedback. Um, and then you'll see another note that we just, or another column we just included, which was uh, ICSE Vegas. So we did outreach to try to meet with them at ICSE. Uh, but you can see some of them that we're working with that need a franchisee. When we have that lunch and learn, we're gonna talk, you know, see if there's anybody locally that's interested in being a franchisee. We've got others that have showed <coughs> interest. We've removed a few off of this list right now because we're, 
we've got some LOIs and some things working in town um, on some properties here. And then not right now, you can see, and, and, and we've got feedback on why they're not. So Rick can go in there and you can see, hey, this is what the site selector said. Here's why they don't want to be here. But, but I'll tell you, we, coming off of an ICSE conference um, that was really a strong conference this, this last May, um, there's, there's a lot of interest in Canyon City. We've got, you know, just, just as I mentioned, the two, um, the, the two businesses or two national retailers that were here in the last two weeks. Um, we've actually had three LOIs. So an LOI is a letter of intent. So that's when uh, a retailer will um, submit a letter of intent because they want to occupy a space, whether it's lease space or it's they want to buy a property there. We've, uh, we had one back out on us just, was that today? A couple recently. Back a couple, back. a couple recently. One was just this week. And last week. Last, last week. Yeah. That's right. The and the reason they gave for backing out was the workforce. Right. They're they're worried about being able to to staff the location. And and we've been working with this re, this restaurant for about a about a year and a half. Year and now. a half. Yeah. yeah. We had our first talk with them about a year and a half ago. This this is one of the you know the 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 initial the initial thought for the market was no we don't want it. Um, but then they came back after more conversations and said, yes, we do want it. Um, then the operations person for the, for the restaurant, corporate restaurant, um, left and was replaced by a new operations person. And that person came to town and said, no, we don't want it right now. So there's, there's always, there's always question marks. You know, there's always the possibility they're, they're interested, but not interested. Um, it is kind of a quirky, quirky thing, you know, on the housing side, I've talked about this in the past too. We fall into this weird, it's almost like a data vacuum for housing developers. We can't show that we have a demand here. That's why we did the housing and housing study that we just did. It's kind of that way on the retail side too. It's, it's hard to show in the case of this restaurant that just backed out last week, we're kind, they consider us kind of like an island that we're not necessarily close enough to Colorado Springs to pull the workforce. And I keep talking about how we're too close and too far from Colorado Springs at the same time. And this is one of those, one of those cases where we're just, we know that we've got, we know that we've got the demand. We know that we have the people and 59% of the people in this county are working outside the county. So there's workforce out there that could come back, but it doesn't show in the data. So what Aaron was saying too, is that they'll go back to this company and and have more conversations with this company about about the market just to fill in all those gaps of information but so the so this restaurant we're working on setting up a meeting for really about a week and a half is when we're going to meet with them and just to to go through and, and and show them the sites again and they're on and off again um depending on who they are so they'll be i have full confidence they'll be located here at some point we just got a we've got a new real estate director we've got a get up to speed on the market uh but there's good interest in the market we're working with a, another group that that wants to be here um it just takes time uh to be honest with you but you know the main goal there and if you'll remember from my first presentation way back i said we got to get people to town here we've got to get people looking at canyon city from outside of just this this area we've got to get site selectors looking from outside and um no question that's happening but we've got to push even harder and um so that's that's where we're at right now i, I wanted to be here in person to answer any questions um if you had any on just kind of what the process looks like um i'm still you know really confident uh in in, in the fact that some of these are going to locate here pretty soon um but we've got to push hard i mean the real reality is is Canyon City is competing with with other similar sized communities, not just in Colorado, but across the U.S. And we've got to be aggressive because we want to make sure Canyon City is at the top of that list. When they when they say, hey, we're going to open 10 stores in the U.S., how do we make sure Canyon City is at, at you know, one of those 10? So um, any, anything else? And I, I should add, too, that we have a local investor now who's in negotiations with a franchise. So um, locally, we're starting to bring people into the fold, I guess you could say. Uh, and that was through a lot of conversations. And I actually texted her in Vegas with another idea, uh, but she told me at the time that she's in negotiations right now with one. So it's, it's a good thing, you know, even local investors are starting to take interest and work with the retail coach to, to find out who to talk to, you know. And the nice thing about that is, is we were in a conversation with her and, and we were able to go through different 
retails. She's retailers, you know, restaurants. She says, I'm interested in this kind of a business. I don't want to work too much. I want this, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want a, a lot of staff. You know, what, what fits that mold? Um, and she found one that she's negotiating with right now. So. Very sorry to interrupt. I can't stop that reboot. It's going to happen in about two minutes. We may have to put a pause while I get everything back up and running. So we're, we're hearing from IT. Uh, we'll have a forced reboot of the computer, and we will have to restart uh, the, the live stream here. Uh, we will stop any discussion uh, when the computer reboots. So the last thing I'll add before we get to, to questions, if that's okay, is uh, we're not just going after retailers and restaurants uh, from a national, regional standpoint. We're working with the local businesses as well through this lunch and learn and some of these other things. And then we're also focused on developer recruitment. So um, we've got a lot of retailers that are interested. We don't have a whole lot of retail space existing to put them in. So we're working to find some developers. Uh, we've had, we have two good conversations going right now where somebody would come in and build development space, uh, one being a local investor and then another being an outside investor that would come in and, and build more space for retail. I like the area. Uh, I like extending this market out towards four mile um, it is a potential there, but then there's also some, some more in town development space available as well. So those are some of the things just that we're, that we're looking at at the, at the moment also. And that's been the more challenging part the development side of things. Um, my, my meetings at ICSC were, were not the most positive when it came to development costs. And, you know, it was really discouraging, honestly. But the retail was very interested. I met with the, the master broker for Home Depot, and he and I were talking about his site out there. And, and um, he loves the community. They want to they wanna promote that site, but um, development costs are really expensive right now. So that's the challenge. I guess we can take questions until it reboots. Huh? <laughs> until, until the, yes, Andrea. Uh, I was just wondering uh, what's going on with the tr the train depot where the bank was. Are there plans for that, or is somebody looking at um, that? The one on Ninth Ninth Street. The the chamber is looking at that right now as a potential uh, Colorado visitor center. Good. So the, the chamber is still looking at that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, they've made some pretty good progress recently, and they're they're gonna they're discussing a feasibility study at the moment. So would they be taking the whole uh, building? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. In in a, as a kind of a there'd be space available, ten office spaces, um, a visitor center area that would be part of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're they're looking at the whole building. Thanks. Anyone else? Well, well, we can talk. I mean, just, I'm not being rebooted, am I? You try, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we could? Uh, I, I also, I, you know, involved in real estate a little bit, and I had a discussion with someone from the Midwest that I've encouraged to come here and build some duplexes and stuff. And he talked to me yesterday, and he said, I'll be interested if you can get building costs at about $200 a square foot. It's like, oh, I don't, uh, we couldn't do that. And at the price, at the square footage cost that I had figured uh, when I was doing it, it was 230 and And I, because you can't accomplish the rent return that he would or they would require to have. Yeah. And as Rick has said, the same way with retail, till you, tack on or until you get the cost, even on an existing structure, it gets you know, pretty, pretty heavy. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the reality. That's the world we live in right now is you've got these developers that are looking for 12% return on investment and, yeah. and they're able to get 8%, 7 or 8%. And it's, you know, it's just not able to, to get those numbers where they, we are starting to see numbers come down a bit from a construction standpoint and those things. So I think it is coming down, but it's not coming down as fast as we would like it to. No, they they had talked about a cap rate that was unrealistic for us, our market, yeah. and told them that I believe the upside is tremendous, but you may have to start with a lower expectation and get rooted in the community and you're going to like it here. So 
unfortunately, they, they don't go by faith. You know, so. most most of the retailers and restaurants that we talk to, though, or that we have talked to here, they they're they're exceeding expectations. You know, we heard yes. that from we've heard that from Starbucks, yes. and we heard some heard that from others. Is you know, they 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 don't build large enough, right? right? When they when they open here, and then they exceed what their projections were. So uh, that's a pos- that's definitely a positive thing, but something we need to. Uh, you know, that return on investment is the is the key with a lot of these developers. Yeah, they're rather cold about that number usually. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. What, are, what, are, what are you, are you seeing like 12% cap rates? Is that what you're looking at right now? Yeah, well, that's what they'd like to have, but I don't see that. The reality is it's about half of that. I can yeah. see them being higher, I, but. I tell them if you can get between five and eight right now, you're Recording you're in progress. And again, the idea that I think we have a tremendous upside and uh, not because I'm terribly biased for the community, I am, but it is. And uh, we'll, we have a confluence of some really good things happening, some good loan programs for residential houses and a very low average that has dropped again, average home sale. I think that will draw more people our way who are willing to take that drive if they ever get 115 fixed now that they've accomplished the traffic <laughs> circle. But anyway, and the same way with Pueblo. So I think there's, that's in a very near future, and that would cause more people to come here. And the advent of the po- and availability of a really good uh, internet uh, that we'll have and do have, so they can work from home, so. It appears that we're back live it on. appears that we're back. I, I felt the new boots. And there's a the hand up. Oh, Amy, yep. yes, hi Amy. Hi, how are you doing? Um, I just had a couple of questions. I was curious if you were able to share anything more about the Office Depot and what some of the challenges there may be. Sure. And then um, based on the retail coaches, aggressive recruitment and kind of all of the things that you've done on our behalf, have we seen any businesses move to the community in the past year? Thanks. So Office, De- I'll start with Office Depot. Uh, so. Uh, Office Depot um, location wise and the layout uh, has made it a little bit hard for for most of the retailers that we've talked to so we pitched it to I'd say probably close to 20 retailers that fit that square footage they have there Um, what we've heard from most of them is they'd like to have co-tenancy or they'd like to have some similar retailers and and restaurants around them Um, so because of that they don't want to kind of be out there on an island so we're we're working with um, you know, the, the, the property owner, the, the, the development owner there about maybe looking at maybe splitting that into a couple of different spaces instead of having the one large available space there, but splitting it into a couple of different spaces, maybe more of a mixed use type development going in there as well. But that's, that's been most of the feedback is just layout, um, just the site, just like I said, how it's laid out, how, how you've got to turn to get into it, those sort of things have, have been a little bit less appealing to some of the retailers that we've talked to. Um, so as far as um, anybody that's located here. Well, let, let me f- follow okay. up on the Office Depot. I, um, I have conversations with the owner of the building on a pretty regular basis, and he called today actually to ask me if I'm going to be in town. Tomorrow, he has somebody that wants to look at the building which is a positive. Um, he called me, he and I spoke about a month ago, he wanted to, he's gonna probably end up coming here talking to Ka- uh, Kathy and Patrick about this possible sectioning off the building. Um, he asked me, before he, before he decided to go this route, he asked me if we wanted that in our community because it would be more like a warehouse type space for contractors, maybe there'd be office in the front, they'd put trucks in the back, that kind of a thing because uh, he was concerned about the lack of sales tax dollars. And I said, well, you know, we do have potential need for something like that. However, if you were to do that, you're also creating a perfect space for a distillery or a brewery or something like that, uh, which, which sounded pretty interesting to him as well. Um, I don't know, when he called me yet today, he didn't say whether he was having somebody come and look at the place for construction or interested in leasing the space. I'm not sure what that visit's going to be, but he's probably coming to town Friday and, and we'll, we'll spend some time together going through and talking about 
that built that building. So he's been fr pretty frustrated because he's gone through more than the retail coaches tried to find. Um, he's actually going to probably fire the broker because he's not getting the success that he wants. Uh, he's mentioned that a couple of times. So uh, he's pretty frustrated with it right now. He was looking at the entire corner also. See if he could do something with the entire corner. And that didn't happen because somebody else bought the gas station. He was trying to buy the gas station. So he's, he's very actively, very actively trying to turn this into something that's, that's going to benefit us. He loves this community, though, and he wants to do something that's going to be a good fit for the community. Um, and then uh, to your question about which, which ones have located because of the retail coach, I don't think anybody is located yet solely because we brought them in. I'll, I'll tell you, we've had conversations with the, uh, the Planet Fitness. We've had conversations with the Arby's. We've had uh, conversations with Les Schwab, some of the others that have come in over time. Um, I will tell you, I think the, the three or four that we've, we mentioned already that we're working with, I, I think we can plan to, you know, knock on wood, but hopefully see some of those locate here soon, just based on where they're at in the discussion, having looked at sites, you know, having submitted LOIs in the past, those sort of things. I feel pretty good about that. But if you'll remember from that first presentation I gave about 23 months ago, we talked about that 18 to 36 month time frame is what we would be looking at from a new development standpoint, somebody being open by that time. So I think we're still in that um, time frame that we had talked about initially, but I hope that answers your question. Like I said, even, you know, if somebody, you know, one of these ones that we're talking about um, that's interested or has, has an LOI, we're not going to take full credit for that. Rick's doing a lot of the work on, on that end as well. So it's a partnership, but does that, does that answer kind of what you're looking for there? Yeah, that's awesome. helpful. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Having been slightly involved in economic development, um, I'm not a very patient person, and that's probably why it was just a slight involvement, because it takes time, and it's not easy, and it takes a lot longer than you want to as a community and also as the actual recruitment people. So let me just put that out there that I know it takes a long time sometimes, and you have to hit them over and over over while they're hitting back to try and get somebody here. You know, I, I have gray hair for a reason, and uh, it, it is a frustrating process for sure. You know, some of the in economic development, some of the deals that you think are a shoe in or 100% going to happen don't happen, and then the ones you're not expecting to happen do happen, right? So, I've I've been involved in, in at the retail coach now going on 16 years, and um, yeah, it's it's a frustrating process, right? But then when you have that success or you have them open up, it's 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 a big win, right? When when those do happen, and you know, I I, I think Canyon City's set up for success. Whether we get to keep working with y'all or not, uh, there's a lot of retailers, there's a lot of developers, there's there's people from outside of Colorado Springs, outside of Denver, that are starting to look at Canyon City, and that's going to be the key is just continuing to cast a little bit wider of a net to get more interest. You know, the site selectors, like I said, coming out of Dallas coming out of Phoenix, coming out of LA, really looking at this market. I, I think, you know, the future is bright. Uh, you look at the, some of those numbers that we showed with the incomes continuing to grow, the population growing. I know y'all are, we're, we're trying, y'all are trying to get more housing growth to happen here and those sort of things. But I do, just based on the conversations that we've had with some of these retailers and restaurants at the conferences and just, you know, over the phone and email recently, I, I feel good uh, about what's to come. Um, but you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, I, it's a frustrating process for sure. I am not a patient okay. person either, so I can relate to that. I, I, anybody else for a minute? I got a couple questions. Yes, sir. And, uh, and I'm going to kind of be, I guess, if you want to say almost the devil's advocate. Sure. At some point in time, we have to look at the cost for bringing in any business. After so long, the economics of it doesn't make sense at all. Sure. We're spending a lot of money as a city. And that's our taxpayers' money. And we need, and, and I know things take time. I, I, again, economic background, worked for the SBA, but I analyzed businesses that were in trouble to see if they were able to get SBA loans. Sure. Um, but I think we really need to look at the cost of how long this is taking. Um, 
I, I've got a I've got a question. Um, a couple of them. One is, you know, you're saying Canyon City, but you represent a lot of cities, and there, and and we know that a restaurant chain can only build so many per year. Sure. And I, and it, please don't take this the wrong way. It sounds good to say we got Canyon City up here, but I would imagine when you go to the other cities in Colorado or that we got you up here. Uh, and and please don't take that wrong. Sure. As a business, you have to do that. Um, and y you know, there's there's lots of business or lots of cities reaching for a handful of each business coming out. I sure. understand all that. So I, I want to make sure that we get that and represent that. And then, like I said, the cost. Um, you know, that's the one thing. It's just for our taxpayers. I want to make sure that we're we're getting costs because right now. We haven't seen a whole lot of results, and I and I get time. Sure. But at some point in time, we've got to see something a little bit more solid. Sure. Otherwise, I feel that we are wasting taxpayers' money, and that's. I'm just gonna. If you want to go on that, you can. Or. Yeah. But I'm just getting that out there. No, I, I, and I completely understand. I'm a taxpayer myself. Not obviously not here, but where and I sit on an economic development board back where where I live in in Texas, and I completely understand that. You know, I think the reality is. You're right. I think Canyon City is going to grow. At, you know, at some point, you're going to start to see some of these retailers and restaurants come in, whether you do anything or not. Right? You're going to see some of them come in just because they're going to see. You know, just it, it's going to make sense in their development process. Um, but that being said, ever since kind of COVID happened and site selectors, there's not as many of them as there were post COVID and those sort of things, you've got to work a little bit harder to get in front of these retailers and restaurants. So if you want to land some of these retailers and restaurants that the citizens are wanting and those sort of things, you, you do have to work hard. You have to get in front of them. And what it comes down to, and really I think what you're paying for more than anything is the relationships, right? So um, I learned a long time ago, it's not all about what you know, it's about who you know right and you could go out and you could probably find a lot of this data on your own and, and and try to put it together but being able to get in front of the site selector right being able to get in front of that gatekeeper the person that makes that decision that's that's really what we bring to the table right so if we are able to land just one or two of these retailers and restaurants that we have on the hook right now you're going to see what you've paid in sales tax paid paid back two threefold right just within the first couple of years, you'll see that happen um, with some of the ones that we're talking about there. So yeah, I'm with you. I, you you've got to be able to show that, um, you know, the return on investment that we were talking about with properties you've, you've, or with, with developments, you got to be able to show that return on investment. So I completely understand that. But again, you're competing with these communities across the board. And I can promise you, we're, we're not overburdened with too many projects. Um, just you know, I'd be happy sharing even more of that air table, not the whole, you know, not every single, you probably don't want to see every single comment in there, but just so you could see what, which ones really are interested, which ones are not, why are they not interested? What is that feedback? Just so you would have a better understanding of what, what we're hearing on a daily basis from the prospects. I, I think some of us on, on council would absolutely want to see some of that because sure. like I said, I would love to see some more economic growth here. Sure. Absolutely. If, if you don't, your city, city becomes stagnant. Sure. Um, but even on some of your numbers that you were per, you know, shown at the beginning on, on even average, average income and that, you know, I think that was a skewed on the, on the high end, um, you know, because we are a low income county. I mean, it is what it is. Uh, and, you know, your area on your map looked good. It was a big area, but, you know, most of, there's very little of that that's, that's yeah, people. How's that? That's the best thing. But, you know, and, I, and I'm not trying to get hard on this. I'm just trying sure. to say, you know, I guess I want to see some results because, yeah, the, the, if you get one business in, it's still going to take a while to come back to, to make up that much sure. in just sales tax. Yep. And, and I think that we also just need to be fair to our, to our taxpayers because bottom line is, you know, we are the, we are the stewards of, of their tax money. So, sure. Thanks. Well, and what I would share is just from that initial conversation we had two years ago is that 18 to 36 month kind of time frame, we're there, right? So we're in the middle of that. You know, if at the end of that 36 months, there's nothing there, I would be right there with you. I'd say, hey, we're, what are we doing here, right? But there's so many good conversations happening 
that I feel confident in in where we are. But but I'm I'm with you, and I, I completely understand. That you represent the citizens, right? And it's it's all about you know sales tax coming in and those things. The other part of it is quality of life, right? And quality of life to get more people to move here to 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 keep your citizens, you know enthused and happy they a lot of they want to see retail they want to see restaurant they don't want to have to drive to colorado springs for this so that's that's that other part of it that we can help is is bring in you know in, in, enhance that quality of life which is already good here but getting some more of that retail and restaurants so you know and i look at this another an, another way too is is um what if we don't what's it going to cost if we don't you know, we haven't, the community hasn't grown in 50 years. Um, we have, and I think about this with the, when I was on the rec center initiative, the pool initiative, anything that, that really base infrastructure needs we have in this community. If from an economic development perspective, we don't want to be like Salida, we don't want to be like Boulder, we don't want to, then we need to have some guidance, some control of what we bring here because we want to right-size the community and make the community self-sufficient. Um, if we don't do it, what are we going to get, for one? But if we can't generate the growth that we need, we're going to continually have to go back to voters for 2A and things like that to get infrastructure. Um, we need the growth through population, through retail, through um, jobs, and that's, that's another topic. Uh, to, to make this community self-sufficient, to right-size the community. And if we don't invest in economic development activities, recruitment activities, um, what will we get? And then, uh, you know, from, from the cost perspective, retail coaches, about a half-time employee equivalent, maybe, you know, less than that probably. Um, so I think from a cost perspective, once we do start to see the activity, it's going to be a it's going to be a, a good return on that investment, I think. But um, I just look at things from a much much broader perspective, and trust me, I feel very responsible for our economic growth here, and I am not at all happy with it right now. So, talk about wasting taxpayer dollars. I feel like me being in this position sometimes is wasting taxpayer dollars no, and because I we're not seeing the results that no. I think we need to have. And, and you know I want to see, I believe in growth. Yeah, I'm not anti-growth at all. But I'm just saying, if I was a regular taxpayer right now sitting back watching, I'd be okay, enough's enough, come on. You're, you're spending our money and what are our results? And, and, and I understand, like I said, I understand a lot of it. But I think at some point in time, we need to see something. We all agree with that. So, okay. Yeah, so uh -huh. Tim, I have a question. Um, he's in the middle uh, of the 18 to Just want to draw months. attention to the hand on the screen. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there's, I'm so sorry, Emily. <laughs> That's your, okay. Go your ahead. yellow hand sorry is going up. Yes. The, the 18 sorry. to 36 months, we, that's something that was discussed up front when we decided to go with him. So do you, what are, are you saying? We shouldn't, we should stop it at 18 months? No, I'm okay. not saying that, Just, but I would like to- Do you feel I, like I, we should go through th the full 36? I, I don't know if we should go through the full 36 myself, uh -huh. but I would like to eventually see mm -hmm. some progress. Here's something saying, we got one coming into our town. Because, and, and I know it takes time, trust me. I, I know this, this I've, I've been in this, this deal. I've, you know, like I said, I worked for the SBA for a long time. So where, so, where well, where is where is the line? That do, do you have a line? Do I have a line? Is there, is there? Oh, I think by 24 months you should at least have something. I, I I really do. Yeah, that's. I just wanted to know I mean, what the specifically. But that's my, but that's my own opinion. Uh, Mr. Emily. Mayor. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, Emily. Yeah. Emily. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I, I wanted to just ask a question or maybe it's make a comment or I'm not sure what it is, but I, those of us who do any tr traveling and I mean like driving trips, whether it's within Colorado, other states, wherever it is, uh, you see, I see a pattern over and over where you see endless development and I'm talking retail development in suburbs, in cities or outskirts of cities, 
you see shopping malls, whether it's strip malls or big, you know, very large shopping malls, outdoor, whatever they are. You see endless numbers of these uh, chain restaurants, whether it's fast food, sit down restaurants, whatever kind they are, where you'll just see them show up there over and over. And I do wonder, are, are the site selectors that you interact with, are they just in this mode of always looking for that kind of location and then they don't know what to do with a community like ours which is different it's not just different in size it's different in economics it's different in how far or close we are to other larger communities i i just wonder do site selectors are they only interested in these suburban shopping malls and not so much in our community you know, that's, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, some of those suburban areas are the, are the easy areas, right? So it's kind of a plug and play for them. It's the, 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 the puzzle right. piece part of it, right? Um, a lot of times, you know, these site selectors, these brokers go where the deals are the quickest and the easiest, right? And those are the quickest and the easiest deals. Canyon City yeah. is not going to be the quickest and the easiest deals, right? Um, you know, there's... For a lot of these restaurants, a lot of these retailers that we've talked to, there's not that A++ site they're looking for, right? So that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why it's taking longer to get a deal done here than it would, say, in a suburb of, of Denver or Colorado Springs or, or, or something like that. So I, I think you're right, to, to be honest with you. I, I don't know if that was a question or a comment, like you said, but I, I, I agree yeah. with what you're – I agree with your premise there, what you're saying, is that mm -hmm. in – Yes, those are the quick and the easy deals. That's why you've got to work even harder to get Canyon City noticed mm -hmm. by these site selectors. Uh, right. so to uh, kind of build on impression. that <laughs> just, just a little bit as an example, you, you have these site selectors. They're looking at overheads from GIS maps. You know, is, is this a good place? Um, you know, they, they lose uh, the capability of uh, understanding the scale that, you know, from one edge of town to the other edge of town is 10 minute drive or what, whatever. But one of the things that we hear a lot is, I, I don't like that site because it's next to the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, there, there's no context that the railroad only go, you know, it's only running twice a day uh, on those tracks. And, you know, there, it's not going to create the noise or the, the traffic congestion problems that they're anticipating. So it, it really is about being out there educating these site selectors about what the community is and, and um, you, know, you know, talking about those types of nuances. Absolutely. I don't see any more yellow hands or anything. So I just have a quick question. Is that number, is that exclusive of the population, the offenders population in our surrounding institutions? There's about 9,000 to 10,000 that are not coming out to buy hamburgers. Do, is, do you include that in that? I've it, heard it, that in a few, I mean, and I've also heard at one franchisee that I had worked with when they found that out, the same way with the average income, they left and they went to Parker. Uh, so is that the case? Uh, I don't know. So it, it, honestly, it depends on the reports that we're using and depends on the retailer that we're using. So the trade area population there, that 50,000 does include anybody and everybody within the, within that area. We do have the ability to pull that number out of there uh, if needed. We haven't gotten that many questions about, uh, you know, I think there was a comment earlier about the, the incomes being too high and that we haven't been asked, uh, nobody's questioned our numbers yet. Um, which is which is positive. I mean, you look across the U.S. and your your average household incomes are increasing almost everywhere, right? But here, for them to increase by seventy five hundred, that's 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 a big jump. And and you know, we we triple check the numbers to make sure that was that number was correct. Yeah. And you know, it might not be right here in Canyon City, but some of the surrounding areas that we've seen some higher end housing go in and some of those things that's helped bump that up. But um, it depends on uh, you know how far along in the the process we are. Uh, with the data, some of the data does include incarcerated, some does not. Um, so a lot of, in that 50,000 population we're looking at there, that does include that, yeah. but we're also including daytime population in there. So those are workers that are coming from outside yes. of the trade area. So it, it just depends on what retailer, what restaurant we're looking, we're working with. Are they looking for daytime population? Are they looking for total population? Um, so it just, it, Yeah, and I had, um, 
with my sense of humor, of course, I said, I know, but they make a really good license plate. <laughs> so They do. But uh, I, have, I buy the commercial sites, too, and I see an uptick in large franchises like Amazon and people like that that hit the site. And I don't have the ability that you have. Sure. But I, I look at that, and I think, wow, because it has increased dramatically those larger companies I'd never guessed and large real estate firms from, especially Texas, I think they want to escape Texas. Oh, sorry, you're from Texas, I'm sorry. But um, I've seen an uptick in that on the commercial sites that I purchase um, that look at Canyon City. And I have listings just in Canyon City. Sure. So, but um, I don't know what that means, but other than that was a question and I, I must have failed to disclose that to them. But and, and again, we do make a heck of a good license plate. So, just so, go ahead. I I do have a question, but it's it's actually for Rick. So my question is, is there any virtue? You know, I mean, it, it seems obvious to me that if you have a cell phone that doesn't ever move away from a hundred yard radius, <laughs> that you know who that who that <coughs> person might be. But is there any virtue to dropping those numbers out of the numbers that we're looking at? I mean, if, if, they're, if they're not participating in our economy, wouldn't it be better not even to have them in the data set? Well, you, you'll, you guys will be getting the, the housing study in the coming weeks. That does it in some cases. It takes the, takes the prison population out and then analyzes the economy based on the remaining population. And it, and it has an impact. I think there would be a benefit to doing that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, we haven't had retailers saying, are the prisoners in the population? They haven't looked at it that way yet. Uh, but there, there could certainly be a benefit and see what it does on the demographic side of the oh, data. So, so the, you know, I, I think my point is, is that, is that we, we believe that the prison population distorts Mm -hmm. what we think we're doing here, what in terms of economics or housing or, or taxpayers or whatever. And wouldn't it be better not even to have those in, in, our, in our database in the first place? Yeah, I was actually in a conversation with the state demographer last week, and, and we kind of talked about the same thing. She says, you gotta, you got to be careful with your data. Okay, because so <laughs> because the, then, then, I'll, then, then I'll ask you then, how easy is it to cut those out? It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's very easy. So basically the, the prison population, the, it's going to show up under group quarters mm -hmm. um, in our housing or demographic data. So very easy. I mean, we actually already have that. We already mm -hmm. have it removed. So, uh, and so it's not hard at all to do that. Well, it, it would seem to me that that would pr present a lot better economic future to the to the uh, to the to the site selectors uh, you know a, a lot better economic picture to the site selectors than than having a, them in there we'll have to put add a notation excluding inmates you know <laughs> in our data. well it would in, wouldn't it increase your average uh, family income because they they don't they would earn less and yeah you know, that's a that's a good question that's when I get back to the office, so. I can sit down with our team and we can see what is, how, how high does that income rise if we remove because I, I'm not that sure if they're makes reporting me think income. About I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. I, I, don't, I don't think it's reported as part of the average family okay. household income. Okay. Uh, they, they look at, as Rick, Rick's talking about with the, um, the housing study, you know, they, they look at household income. Uh, so group quarters is yeah. removed from the household. That would be removed, yeah. Uh, demographics. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions of council? Can I can I add one last thing? Yes. Go right ahead. Uh, you know we we're going to keep we, we we in this current partnership. I think we've got another month of working together um, before you'll have the need to look at that third a year weeks, yeah. uh, or a couple weeks. We're we're going to keep pushing hard. Um, I will say this: whether we get a chance to keep working with y'all or not, your city administration, economic development staff have been awesome to work with. When we've had these site selectors come to town and we've had these 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 tours and these visits come, Rick in particular is willing to roll out the red carpet, meet with them, you know, even if he has something else going on. So it's, uh, I hope we get to keep working with y'all, but it's it has been great these these first two years. So appreciate y'all for that and. Uh, thanks for having me today. Thanks. 
Eric. Thank you, Rick. Um, hi. Hi. Any Thank you. concluding remarks? No, no I'd, um, f first of all, Tim, I totally agree with you. I want to see results too, and they did, they did too. They wanted to see a, a, a slam dunk. Um, but the challenges we have right now, um, had we not had an increase in interest rates, we probably would be in a different position right now. Because that's, and, yeah. and, and throw COVID in there because COVID just threw construction costs way out of whack, way out of whack. Uh, we'd be in a different place right now, but I'm not gonna pass the buck on anybody else. We've gotta get it done. Yeah, it's, it is, um, the construction lending costs are extraordinary, and um, it is a frustrating thing. I like to sell houses. I'm not crazy about commercial because I'm excited about Canyon City, and, and there are a lot more people looking at my little websites that I'd never heard of before. So I think that's out there. What that's going to meet on the ground, I don't know how soon. But it's, it's exciting to see that. And there is one, I'll call him local, broker developer that we both have had conversations with. He's actually a friend of Aaron, um, who is, has landed a couple of projects in the last year and a half who is still very interested in, in calls about uh, like what's going on at Waffle Wagon, what's going on with this site. You know, he, he calls to ask about sites that I can't talk about because they're privately owned. Um, so he's very interested in continuing his development in our, in our town. So the ones that are here see the, see the benefit like you're talking about before, but getting them here to, the, to that point, uh, even the, even the, the corporate franchise guy who I was emailing, emailing, e emailing with about this project that just failed last year, last week, he said it's like you gotta prove it. Yeah. You gotta prove it. You gotta build it to prove it. You know, and that's a bit of a challenge for developers. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank Can you I again. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Amy. Um, I'm curious. Could you tell us how many different site selectors have come to Canyon over the, the course of the second year of the contract? I think that might help kind of give a, um, a better sense of the, the activity that's ongoing. Thanks. Four. At least four? Yeah, uh, one came right after I went to ICSC in 2021. Um, there's one who's in town very frequently. He's the one I was just talking about. Um, the Office Depot has had them in also. Um, there's one uh, There's one up in Denver who's, there's been at least six. I, I think it, it may be better to analyze it, not necessarily based on the number of developers, yeah. but the number of visits. And you know, we can put some, something together to kind of track that for you. Yeah, we, we can yeah. help with that for sure. Thank okay. you. And Thank thanks you. again oh. for your time and the effort that you, um, that both of you put in on behalf of economic development in, in Kenya. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. My pleasure. That it? Everybody done? Good. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a safe trip. Thank you. Are you going to miss Whitewater? Huh? Are you going to miss Whitewater? <laughs> yeah. He is missing Whitewater. Uh oh. Oh, am I going to? Yeah. Thank you all. Oh, yes. So then on the agenda, we have the, our esteemed chief of police and Commander Sabatino to talk with us about a sound ordinance or an ordinance regarding sound. And which way do we say that? So I guess we would start out with the chief. Why don't you go ahead? 
Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, on behalf of uh, city council and at the direction of Mr. Stevens, we uh, collaborated with um, our parks, our, I'm sorry, our, our public works department director and uh, Colorado State Patrol um, to address a concern that citizens brought forth in a, a recent meeting to council concerning uh, noise from vehicles in the uh, city. Uh, specifically, I, I unfortunately was not at that meeting, but um, the complaint as expressed to me surrounded around uh, the issue of engine brakes, Jake brakes, otherwise known as Jake brakes on commercial motor vehicles coming through the uh, city. Um, in concert with uh, Mr. Evans and Colorado State Patrol and our city attorney and municipal attorney, um, the, the recommended amendment to uh, the municipal code has been provided in your pack, your packet um, to prohibit the use of uh, compression engine brakes uh, except as provided um, here uh, between uh, First Street and Justice Center Road uh, along the US 50 corridor. Um, as long as we erect the appropriate signage. Uh, there is a provision for emergency situations um, for the uh, commercial motor vehicles. Um, additionally to that, um, because a, there's been a concern also uh, around just general safety uh, matters um, with commercial motor vehicles. Um, so a, additional to the recommend, recommended proposed uh, ordinance change, um, we would recommend adopting an annual schedule for CCPD to uh, coordinate with uh, Colorado State Patrol and host uh, level one commotion, commercial motor vehicle inspections um, on a quarterly basis uh, just to enhance uh, the safety of commercial motor vehicles coming through into and through Canyon City and uh, to educate uh, that uh, community on um, the new ordinance. So, are you, I'm, you're talking about an ordinance that would be renewed or reviewed yearly? No, sir. No, sir. The, the scheduled, the scheduled uh, maintenance or, or inspections of commercial motor vehicles, that would be part of our recommendation okay. to enhance adherence to the, the proposed ordinance the, and to make sure we have safety components in place for our commercial motor vehicle traffic. Yeah, the, the PD would work with State Patrol to schedule these quarterly uh, vehicle inspections to make sure that uh, the, the uh, trucks themselves have the appropriate muffler equipment on, it's unaltered, um, all of those types of things that State Patrol already does um, elsewhere, but I don't, I don't know, I, it has to be a assistance that, the, that we have to request from them in order to do this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We would schedule in advance. You couldn't, we couldn't just do it on our own. We have to do it with the highway patrol. <coughs> That's a considerable cost um, okay. for us to uh, do it with internally within the PD because we would have to we would have to assign an officer to that exclusively. Uh, a great deal of, of training okay. to to host those level one and level two inspections. And this doesn't include. A, a decibel meter or anything? No, sir. Just, just the, just the just inspections. The use of the Jake brake okay. um, within those parameters. Yeah. What what I think we're requ um, what we're looking at here is, you know, the state already has laws requiring the the use of engine mufflers. Um, so, you know, that would you know we we would put up signs to enforce or re restate that that is a requirement within the city limits. Uh, additionally, the ordinance that we have before you would prohibit the use of Jake brakes on Highway 50 between First Street and, do we say Justice, 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 Justice Center? Center? Yes. Except where safety is concerned. I, I believe that was still in there. Is that, 
Yeah. And, yes. and I know, do we have Catherine online? Wait, oh, Amy. Oh, Amy Wait. wants to have some questions. Yeah. Amy has a yellow hand up there. Amy, is that you? Oh. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions, but Ryan, if you had a question for Catherine, uh, happy to, to pause on mine. Yeah, I wasn't sure if she is online with us still or not, and if we lost her. I'm here. Okay. Um, I, I think there were some uh, questions about the ordinance um, when we had some staff discussion about the, the provision around uh, except for safety, uh, the use of engine mufflers except for uh, when there are safety issues. And I, I think Trisha, our city prosecutor, had brought some of those things up. Do you, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, having that provision in and whether or not that limits our ability to prosecute? Yeah, so in, in a version, you know, I think that some things we had talked about before was you know, pedestrian crossings and, and different instances where um, Jake brakes could be used and Trisha's concern was is that we would have a lot of trouble enforcing some of those provisions when Jake you know exceptions I guess um, and dealing with those from a prosecutorial standpoint um, in in essence we had kind of made our our lives pretty complicated by doing that and so I think the the kind of compromise um, language that you know she thought was okay was that um, Jake brakes could be used in emergency or life safety situations. Um, there's going to be some discretion there um, with PD and her office as to when, you know, that occurs. Um, and, and the person who receives the ticket is, is going to have to come to court and, you know, make that claim if, if that's the situation, unless the officer witnesses something that, that deters them from issuing that ticket. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. The, the one consideration that um, you know, we're, we're looking at for um, excluding the use of the, uh, Jake Brakes between First and Justice Center is um, there's no question about decibel meter uh, in that case. Either they were being used in that situation or they were not. It makes it a lot easier for the yeah. police department to uh, recognize whether or not that um, there's a violation or not and not relying solely on a decibel meter. Yeah, had, we had gone through that years Much ago, easier. and the cost of just the vehicle was enormous. Uh, I know Colorado Springs has that, but they have more money they know what to do with, apparently. So, okay. Um, Amy, are you still there? Yes, thank you so much. Um, my question is uh, specific to the engine brake. Um, when this issue first came before council, we had a large number of folks from the Tunnel Drive area who were expressing concern about the use of Jake brakes at, you know, very early hours of the, the day and late at night. Um, our understanding from the county manager is that their contract states that no Jake brakes can be used within the pit area from 6.30 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, however, once those vehicles hit the road, um, they are within city jurisdiction. Um, I know the previous conversations had mentioned that Jake Brakes may need to be used when coming down um, the road from the quarry for you know for safety's purposes, and I just want to make sure that this that we are addressing this concern where we don't have you know many citizens whose quality of life is significantly disturbed because we have Jake Brakes being used. Um, you know, during hours of the day where it's certainly not appropriate. So my concern is just around this language with regard to life safety. And I'm wondering, um, Chief, uh, if how you would interpret it in that particular instance. Thanks. Uh, I'll, uh, I know you addressed it to Chief, but let oh, me, please. yeah, please. Le let me start. Um, I, I think, you know, coming down the hill, um, you know, both uh, Eight Mile Hill, as well as Tunnel Drive, there are still concerns about safety, so we would still uh, allow the use of Jake Brakes. Uh, we do have Leo Evans in the audience as well. Um, I know he, he has to leave here in a minute. Um, he may want to say a few things. Um, but I, I think you know, we're still negotiating a, a crossing agreement with Wholesome, 
and perhaps the, the best thing to do would be to add those uh, hours of limitation into the agreement with the crossing agreement with Wholesome. Uh, and then add additional signage, again, reminding that um, Jake breaks would not be allowed during those uh, specific hours uh, along Tunnel Drive. Okay, thank you. That's, um, that's really helpful to know, and it does seem like that would be a more appropriate place for this particular concern. Um, I do have another question, but I'll pause in okay. case uh, Chief or Director Evans had okay. something to add. Uh, Tim? John, who came? Tim? Uh, uh, Leo's shaking his head no. I think Chief's shaking his head no. So No, I think we pretty much covered it. I, I do have a question for Director Evans, uh, so per, perhaps I could do that. And one of the, one of the things that, that has concerned me about our um, Highway 50 traffic is, uh, you know, uh, in, in the state that I grew up in, uh, they had lane control for semi trucks, uh, and so I, I would like to also ask that that we look at lane control in the same area would be would be perfect um, that a truck's only able to use the right hand lane uh, because uh, when we get two trucks that are racing each other at you know one going a half a mile an hour quicker than the other one. It uh, it can be a little bit frustrating. So I, I, the and, and I don't know if you've uh, have any information on that, but yeah, we I did reach out to CDOT about that request. They do have the same provisions. What I was initially told is that in Colorado they're only applicable on the interstate system, and they don't enforce any lane restrictions off of the interstate system. So I haven't gone back to trace down that legislative path of of how that is to verify that, but that was the initial information I received. So, so that would be my request for, for perhaps our attorneys to uh, answer that question because that would, that would be the appropriate uh, next step, I think, is to see if, if, uh, if we, uh, you know, with our, with our status is able to um, pass something more restricted than what the state has. Yeah, I, I, I agree that would be a question for Catherine or Corey uh, but with it being a CDOT controlled road that that may limit our authority there okay Tim hi thank Chief. you I have a quick question for you just regarding the inspections you know we're saying quarterly inspections um, what is that going to cost you know projectively the city or is is there something wrong with just maybe doing biannual Inspections. Uh, just a curiosity question. I'm, I'm, just curious on that. I don't. It wasn't a cost uh, a examination um, or concern. It, it, it was just purely safety. Um, just trying to enhance the safety of the, the vehicles coming into the city. And after speaking with Colorado State Patrol, there's a percentage of commercial commercial motor vehicle traffic that modifies their mufflers, which make the noise emitted from the engine brake uh, much more vibrant than it should be. Um, so the thought behind it is with the periodic inspections that these types of things will get addressed rather than a one-off and, and we'll see you again next year. Okay. And, right, and state, state Patrol is not charging us for this service, is that no. correct? Okay. No, I was just curious and, it, you know, just wondering if quarterly by, you know, okay, thank you. I mean, we would certainly uh, take council's direction, but we thought this was a responsible or reasonable approach to just enhance safety and educate them on our, our process or our new ordinance, should council choose to adopt it. Okay. To, to add on to that a little bit, it's my understanding that the state patrol actually Microphone. Has Sorry. How about now? Yep. All right. That's my understanding that the State Patrol actually has a certain amount of the commercial motor vehicle inspections that they have to do per year. So not only are they assisting us, but we're also helping them get their numbers, um, you know, to, to, meet, to meet that uh, goal. Okay, John. Uh, and then Amy. we, and then we uh, Amy, you have the yellow hand up. It's your turn. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't sure if it was uh, Mayor Pro Tem first or me. Um, I guess my one other thing I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly, it looks like 
um, 14245A. Um, it's also just talking about anyone operating a vehicle in such a way as to create a loud or unnecessary noise or cause damage to the roadway. Um, so this is that broader provision where we wouldn't have people tearing up and down Main Street completely unnecessarily and ruining the, the lovely outdoor dining. Is that accurate? That is accurate, yes, ma'am. Okay, and we aren't intending to enforce that with a decibel meter. We are just like, if police see it occurring, they, uh, okay. they can do it based on- um, Visual and audio. Okay, yeah. perfect. Hearing the revving yeah. of the engine and the wheels, the reaction by the chassis or the, the suspension, the wheels um, in such a manner that's, uh, you know, rapid acceleration, deceleration, those types of things. That is very exciting. Thank you very, very much. Okay. John, go ahead. Thank you. The, uh, based on our previous discussion, I was uh, perhaps under the mistaken, uh, mistaken impression that, that it would be CDOT that put the signs up, but, it's, but they're telling us that we would have to put the signs up for, for no jake brakes, no compression brakes. Um, Did I ask my question too late? You may have. No, the, I, I believe that was the, uh, the, the finding by uh, Director Evans when he reached out to CDOT. Um, that we, and we talked uh, briefly about it in our last meeting. He's researching signage yeah. um, right now. I, I believe we have to go through a process to put the signs up, but I think we provide the signs, or we pr at the very least provide the wording for the signs. That's possible, yeah. So would it matter if the, <clears throat> whether we erect the signs or cause the signs to be erected, it wouldn't matter for this ordinance? It should not. No. Just the signage itself is adequate to meet the, uh, the code. Okay. Okay. You've gone awful quiet. We're using your compression brakes, huh? I, you know, a compression brake is a, just a common thing on a big diesel truck. They are. And if they're muffled properly, they're not that loud. So that's what they're looking for when with their inspections to see if it's been altered, in essence, to make yes, it louder. Sir. Okay. And if they are, what happens? Well, it, it would be a educational opportunity for sure, and that could be with a warning, <coughs> but uh, certainly could be followed up with a citation. Yeah, the operator would know that they've been altered, you know. So, well, there there would be some there would be some uh, some level of proof to establish there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't see any hand. But a, again, that would be under the state patrol's jurisdiction yes, because sir. they're the ones operating the the stop. Yes. Well, all right, John. The the um, right now the the fine. Uh, area is blank on the document but that would be filled in when it was brought back to council yes okay and do we need a motion or do you just need a sense of council we uh we're bringing you the uh the proposed language now to see if you have any proposed changes uh there would be no motion tonight we would bring it back to a regular city council meeting for first reading. uh first reading so i'm a thumbs up okay all right then well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank Mayor, you. could I just oh, add a quick comment? It looks comment. like Emily has her oh, hand. Oh, Emily, <laughs> you had the yellow hand there. Hi, yes, Hi. and another one. <laughs> anyway, just a quick comment. I, I like the wording uh, proposed in both A and B. I, I think it'll be good to really get this into place, have council hopefully pass it on first and second reading. I know that there are people in my neighborhood that will be happy to know that the noise that we've experienced uh, in recent months from vehicles doing nothing more than revving strange engines very loudly at 2 a.m., uh, that with this, it sounds like we'll have the ability to put that to an end or at least attempt to do that. So I'm looking forward to the passage of this as proposed and the implementation. Thank you, Emily. Anyone else? That's it. I guess we are in adjourned. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.